Now at five, shocking video from Friday as crooks ram a gate in North Portland and knock an employee to the ground. Now one of them is behind bars. A new TriMet light rail line could help cut time for your commute, where it will run and why some are actually against it. And remembering City Commissioner Nick Fish, hundreds come together to honor his life and legacy here in Portland. This is KGW News at five. We begin with gunfire. It happened again early this morning in Portland. We are 47 days into the new year, and this is the 80th shooting of the year. There are a lot of pieces to this puzzle, and here's what we know. Around 1.40 this morning, officers were called to Northeast 102nd and Knott Street for a man who'd been shot in the arm. While they were responding there, another call came in from a hospital. Two men showed up at the ER there. One was shot in the leg, the other the stomach. All three are expected to be OK, but it's not clear exactly where the shooting took place. Police believe it might have happened near the intersection of Northeast Gleason and I-205. Officers did find two cars with bullet holes. So far, no arrests. And while we're on the crime beat, area police believe they have made a big bust that will help take down a multi-state burglary ring that targeted marijuana businesses. Take a look at the loot of what they found during a search warrant in Salem Friday. It includes 16 firearms, $33,000 cash, 30 pounds of pot. Investigators say the ring hit businesses in southwest Washington and Oregon. This obviously is not that video. That's the, what we're trying to show you. Details including how many are under arrest and the investigation on this one is not over, but those are the weapons that they seized. And an update on a story we showed you Friday. A warning, the video is disturbing. Here it is in North Portland. A man and a woman were seen breaking into the 21st century towing. They hop into a truck and when an employee arrives at the gate, they ram the gate, knocking him to the ground. And then they took off. There it is right there. Ah, it's so painful to watch. The stolen truck now has been found and police say they got a tip and arrested the woman involved. She's 24 year old Nicole Pengos Claire, but they are still looking for the man that she was with. If you have information, you're asked to call Portland Police. Now to transportation. TriMet wants to build a new light rail line through southwest Portland, and we're getting a new aerial look at where exactly it could go. Brittany Falkers examines the project and why some are not fans. From Portland to Tualatin in 30 minutes. That's the promise of the new Southwest Corridor light rail project. 30 minutes consistently every day, day in and day out. And that's what this corridor needs as congestion grows. Driving that stretch can feel like an unending trip. 30 minutes would be a decent time most days. And TriMet says traffic on the roadways is only going to get worse, which is why they want to build the new line. Last week, TriMet released this new view of the project, connecting popular spots like Bridgeport Village, Hall Boulevard in downtown Tigard, all the way into downtown Portland. It comes up here, you know, there's areas that it has to go above the street, areas where it's next to the street. It's a project that will cost nearly $3 billion and is still being designed. This is, you know, what a station could look like around it. You have sidewalks, you have businesses, you have some parking, you have parks. TriMet has already made changes based on public input. Barber Boulevard was going to be cut down to one lane each way with the rail down the middle. Now it will be two lanes each way. The big goal here, efficient transportation. So it really does take people off the streets, out of their cars and into the trains and buses. But John Charles doesn't see that happening. So it's just a huge waste of money. He's this the president the of Cascade Policy Institute. That's a libertarian think tank in Portland. They oppose not only this project, but light rail in general. It's not high speed, it's not high capacity, it's really expensive, it doesn't go to most places where people need to go. And in fact, ridership peaked in 2012 and has been declining ever since. Charles believes buses and ride sharing apps are a better option for the future. They have to be rubber tired, road based uh, options because roads take you everywhere you want to go. Back on the Southwest Corridor, TriMet expects the new line will impact as many as 400 homes and businesses. Charles is also worried about that. I think from a human standpoint, the fact that they're going to bulldoze over 200 properties, uh, businesses, homes, kick those people out who have possibly no other place to go, that's a concern. If the new line is built, half the money would come from the federal government. But first, local taxpayers have to agree to pay the other half. 
and we will likely vote on that in November as part of the Metro government's massive transportation package. It's critical we put together a good local commitment on funding. Uh, we do hope that Metro will go forward with a bond measure. We do expect that to happen, and funding for Southwest Corridor would be critical in that. Now, Allstott says that the project is far from being finalized, but as the plans continue to evolve, TriMet wants to hear from you, and you can get a deeper look at the project and weigh in through their online open house. It's here at TriMet.org slash Southwest Corridor. That's SW Corridor. You just click on this button, and it'll take you right there. Now there's also public input meetings. The next one is this Tuesday at the Tigard Public Library. We'll have a link to more of those events at KGW.com. Back to you. Thank you very much, Brittany. Hundreds gathered at Portland State University this afternoon to remember the life of Portland City Commissioner Nick Fish. Fish died from stomach cancer on January 2nd. He was 61 years old. Lindsay Nadrich was at the service today and joins us live. Lindsay. Well, the service ended here just a couple minutes ago, but over and over again, people kept talking about Nick Fish's genuine care for people, how much he loved Portland, his optimism, and how he was accepting of everyone. More than 600 people attended today's service, including many elected officials and people who worked alongside him. A friend of his who spoke said Nick's caring about people and justice had no boundaries. He cared for everyone. Former Governor Barbara Roberts also spoke, saying, it was hard to find the words to describe him because it was not words that defined Nick Fish. You could discern his sympathy and empathy in one handshake. She also said he left us all kinder, wiser, and more deeply connected. Fish spent 11 years on the city council. He's remembered as an advocate for the poor and affordable housing. His service to our city is deeply missed. This is a hard day, and I will tell you, that Nick Fish was the person who always gave public service a good name. When I think of Nick, the two words that come to mind, the two ideas, is he really cared and he really listened. He loved Portland, he loved Portlanders, he loved the work that he was doing at the local level, and this was his life's calling, and he gave everything he had for it. And uh, I'm grateful to him and I'm grateful to his family for, for having shared that time, that energy and that talent to really improve our community. Mayor Wheeler also said City Hall hasn't quite been the same without him and that his absence on the city council is huge. They often ask each other, what would Nick Fish want to know? So they say they're constantly thinking about them and he'll forever be in their hearts. Thank you, Lindsay. Well, the solution is keep status quo. I mean, uh, these groups have been around a long time and we depend on them and they're there when we need them. That's Clackamas County Commission Chair Jim Bernard voicing his concerns about the sheriff's plan to shake up how the county does search and rescue missions. The four volunteer organizations which currently respond to most of the calls on Mount Hood and surrounding areas might be in jeopardy. The plan to create a single rescue team within the sheriff's office has been under discussion for months, but the hammer fell this week. If I were a professional person, mountain rescue guy uh, or gal, I would be upset that the sheriff doesn't trust that they're gonna do the great job that they've done consistently. That's Clackamas County Commission Chair Jim Bernard disagreeing with the sheriff over the decision to change the county's search and rescue operations. Right now, there are four standalone volunteer groups that execute SAR missions for the county. Their certifications are granted by the Clackamas County Sheriff in exchange for their services. But Sheriff Craig Roberts' new plan is to create one unified rescue team within his office, selecting the rescuers and providing all the training and equipment. It's similar to how both the Multnomah County and Deschutes County Sheriff's offices run their programs. Sheriff Roberts says the decision follows recent litigation and the recommendation of a study done by his retired undersheriff, Matt Ellington. Basically, it would give him more control over search and rescue operations. In a statement, he said local response times and communication will improve with a single dedicated team. If a major disaster happens here, this will allow the quick deployment of SAR resources dedicated to Clackamas County. I disagree with the, uh, the sheriff's intentions. But Bernard is not on board and worries about the expense and who will pay for it. According to the sheriff's own report, 
about, it costs about $1.5 million uh, for personnel and equipment. And that is money that is basically given to us by these groups. As for the current volunteer rescuers, many worry about their futures. Under the new plan, the number of rescuers would be significantly cut. There's about 300 volunteers and the Clackman and the Sheriff's Office is going to form a team and limit it to around 100, 150. So you're looking at 100, 150, 200 people that are basically going to have to find another, another, um, you know, sponsor or, or get out of it. But not all the rescue groups are against the change. Stephen Corpy, the president of North Oregon Regional Search and Rescue, says the group is excited for the reorganization, writing, quote, we feel that this change will provide improved structure, teamwork, and organized leadership to help improve our team's effectiveness during trainings and searches. That story still evolving. We'll let you know how it shakes out. And now let's bring in meteorologist Joe Ranieri. A lot of people have the day off tomorrow. Going to be going out do. having fun somewhere. They might be uh, staying close, going to the beach, eh. or going to the mountains. But if you're going to be going to the beach, uh, this is what you're going to be seeing. A lot of sunshine heading into tomorrow. A gorgeous uh, sunset uh, along the Pacific Ocean there in Cannon Beach. You can see a couple people enjoying the last uh, uh, maybe 45 minutes or so of daylight uh, today. But we are going to be seeing a lot of dry conditions over the next couple of days. So for today, we've seen about five one hundredths of an inch of rain. If you're traveling over the mountain passes, we saw plenty of snow up at Timberline Lodge. Basically, since five o'clock this morning, you've seen about a foot of snow. You'll add up to it a little bit heading into the overnight hours, but we'll start to dry out a little bit for tomorrow. And that is going to be the case throughout much of the metro area. Throughout the morning, we'll be seeing some spotty showers. Temperatures starting off in the 30, about 37. And by the afternoon, blue skies, temperatures close to 50. I'll talk more about just how long the sunshine sticks around coming up in about 10 minutes. All right, thank you, Joe. We're going to turn now to the Max stabbing trial, which after more than two weeks is nearing the end. The witnesses have testified. The evidence been presented. Closing arguments now are set for Tuesday, and then the case goes to the jury. Here with a preview is Maggie Vespa. Good evening. Due to the long holiday weekend, court will resume on Tuesday, and then jurors will see each side make their case one last time before going into deliberations. Friday, they heard from the last witness, Dr. Alan Newman, a psychiatrist from California. Basically, he's studied the insanity defense and how it's been used in trials. Prosecutors called him to the stand to counter the defense's claim that Jeremy Christian has autism spectrum disorder and that the disability played a role in his stabbing three people, killing two. It was my opinion that he did not meet the criteria for an autism spectrum disorder. I did think he met the criteria for a diagnosis that we call antisocial personality disorder. Oregon law specifically states that personality disorders don't qualify for the insanity defense. Christian faces a long list of charges, including two counts of first-degree murder. He's accused of boarding a crowded MAX train in May of 2017, aiming an angry, racist rant at two black teen girls, then stabbing three men who either intervened or stood nearby. Ricky Best and Talesian Numkai Meche died. Micah Fletcher survived. Dr. Newman talked about testing Christian for traits common among psychopaths, including a total lack of remorse. He noted Christian felt bad for killing Ricky Best in particular because Best had children. Then Dr. Newman added this. But beyond that, he appeared to feel very strongly that he was justified, um, that this was the fault of um, the others who started the verbal confrontation and that he was justified in the actions that he took. If convicted of the charges against him, Jeremy Christian could spend the rest of his life in prison. We will, of course, be back in court on Tuesday, bringing you updates on air and online.